Hi, I'm Bob Doyle, the information philosopher. I'm webcasting from my ITV studio here in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Now, information philosophy is a the first new philosophical methodology since logical positivism and language philosophy were developed in the early 20th century. And they've been a very powerful set of beliefs or methods. Turn on my little musical system here. But I'm going to argue that information philosophy is capable of solving problems in philosophy that are beyond the ability uh, that comes by arguing about these problems with words and with logical reason. Because uh, philosophy and physics especially, natural philosophy it's called, deals with problems of what's going on in the world and uh, the nature of the universe and our place in the universe. So I want to point out that information philosophy is what used to be called or was called what existed as a systematic philosophy in ancient philosophies or even relatively modern philosophies like that of Immanuel Kant who hoped to be able to solve or say something significant about uh, all the problems in philosophy. Uh, and those problems were gathered together in some great books in the early 20th, early 20th century. Uh, the one I like to turn to is Bertrand Russell's Problems of Philosophy and a few others that went all the way back to Aristotle and looked at his uh, analysis of all the problems. Uh, and then uh, Russell argues, uh, gives us a list of those philosophies, those problems in philosophies and the ancient approaches to them, uh, which famously included metaphysics. Uh, but the one problem we're very interested in today is the problem of free will. Uh, basically, we're in a Tuesday, so I'm going to turn to my book on free will and see what we can uh, pick up for our topic today. I'm going to focus in on a an opposition to the idea of free will. And that opposition is usually known as uh, determinism, uh, that everything is completely determined in the world, including us, and therefore their freedom is at best an illusion, something our brain is convincing us we have, but that is impossible uh, in, in view of the modern understanding of the brain, neuroscience, and claims about biology and how biological uh, events are happening. Uh, I'm going to argue that this is <laughs> basically, in my mind, a lot of nonsense, but it's been a very popular position through the years. And towards the end of the last century, um, a, a philosopher from Notre Dame named Peter Vanenwagen uh, defined a new way of thinking about uh, determinism. Uh, and he uh, Suggest the term incompatibilism, which we have here connected with hard determinism, the idea of a hard incompatibilism. And basically for Van and Wagen, the idea of total determinism would really completely eliminate the possibility that we were responsible for our actions and we couldn't have any moral responsibility. Uh, but I want to uh, look for a moment. Let's take a look into our book. And I have a chapter on a so-called taxonomy of free will positions. Um, let's home zoom in, take a closer look at this situation. The free will debates of the late 20th century tended to be monologues and diatribes defending narrow niche positions against many other possible positions on free will. And this really hasn't changed very much. So I regard it as part of the scandal in philosophy. Instead of carving out narrow niches and developing specialized new vocabularies of technical terminology, philosophy, in my view, would be better served by an effort to standardize the jargon used in the so-called dialectic, which is to say a lot of talking back and forth and arguing. 
we may not be able to achieve the universal ambiguity-free language that Leibniz dreamed of and logical positivists thought they could do, but we would we could try to simplify rather than complicate. And the next best thing is to provide as complete a set of jargon terms as we can assemble. And for that, I've created uh, what I what I call our glossary. I'd like to take a quick look at that for a moment. Let's go to this page and come up here to our uh, familiar information philosopher website. This is what something I want uh, you to know how to do all the time. What I need to go to is slash afterwards. I should provide a slash glossary. See what we got here. Now, to give you an idea uh, of how many uh, jargon terms have been developed in order to come up with uh, language that is used by the philosopher to prove his or her point, um, it's, it's a phenomenal number of, of terms. What I've tried to do with this glossary is give you an alphabetical set of links. Each one of these letters will take you into terms beginning with that letter. And then when you go into a particular entry, let's just uh, go out here for a moment, like actualism. Down below then, I also create links, hyperlinks, to other related terms that are related to actualism. So what I've done is create a, a phenomenally hyperlinked glossary. Instead of going in and reading one definition, what you see is the, the definition, a few a sentence or two about that, and then the links to other related terms that are close to and associated with that term in the hopes that you can drive around in this space, in this language space that's been created by philosophers who are arguing about uh, different issues. Um, I won't go into any of these particularly, but you can probably recognize them as we go by. Uh, and I believe this will be a wonderful tool set. I'm hoping it will be found very useful uh, by anyone who is taking this question of free will and the problem between free will and determinism and so forth. When you're taking it seriously, I would like you to be able to read the literature where anyone is writing and find terms that will be in this glossary so that you can basically uh, uh, make more progress than if you just uh, think you know what uh, that philosopher is talking about. So. Of all the terms I say here, the most important are those used to describe what might be loosely called major schools on free will. Uh, for me, there are three historically very significant terms, okay? Uh, determinism, of course, libertarianism, which says uh, we are not determined, and then this strange idea of compatibilism, which is to say the argument that free will is compatible with determinism that we can be determined by laws of some kind or various uh, forces uh, that aren't our own control, but that we are in the control of some other uh, kind of agencies or laws of nature. And this last uh, compatibilism name is what William James called soft determinism, uh, which is, I believe, logically contradictory. It's sort of an oxymoron to say that free will is compatible with determinism. Nevertheless, we get this very simple taxonomy, okay? And what I'm going to try to do now is set up a, a taxonomy and move on to more and more positions within this taxonomy uh, in order to focus on the one we're discussing today, which is hard determinism. So determinism, hard determinism, we'll see later, it'll be called hard incompatibilism. But these two are opposites and Yet, if we combine them, it would be called compatibilism, or as William James called it, soft determinism. Now, I find, found a significant history of this idea of compatibilism. It's not a brand new idea, although it became very popular in the late 20th century. And at this time, uh, the majority of philosophers uh, think of themselves as compatibilists. Um, so I cite Immanuel Kant, who found this 
a notion in the work of famous English th thinkers like Thomas Hobbes, John Locke, George Berkeley, and especially in David Hume, in short, Hobbes and the so-called British empiricists. And he wrote about it in the Critique of, Pract his critique of Practical Reason. Let's see if I can get this up and up. He said, Although the actions of men are necessarily determined by causes which proceed in time, we yet call them free, because these causes are ideas produced by our own faculties. Now this is rather complicated, uh, but here Kant is summarizing the notion that even if we are caused by prior causes, and for Kant, who was a great physicist, uh, the whole idea of causality was something that came down from Newton's laws of motion for the planets. Uh, and the argument was, if there are laws governing the celestial spheres and basically all of nature outside of uh, man, humanity, uh, then surely those laws must apply to us. But then if the thoughts in our minds, the, 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 the actions we come up with doing, uh, have been caused by prior events, uh, surely that doesn't seem to be free, but they could be said to be free simply because the uh, proximate cause of the next thing we do or the next thing we think comes out of our own minds, comes out of our own brains. He says these ideas are being produced by our faculties. So here I'll just stay with... Uh, with Kant for another moment because of this wonderful phrase that he developed. This, he said, is a wretched subterfuge. And really a miserable substitute is perhaps a better English translation of the phrase he used. But the English phrase is now famous in philosophy, with which some persons so going continued on with Kant. This is a wretched subterfuge with which some persons still let themselves be put off and so think they have solved with a petty word jugglery, and the German is Klein and little Wortklauberei, word clobbering. So he says, uh, Kant says, they, have a, they use a petty word jugglery to solve that difficult problem at the solution of which centuries have labored in vain and which can therefore scarcely be found so completely on the surface. And I agree that what we're talking about here is sophistry, used to solve the problem of free will and determinism by a language game that redefines freedom. And I'm sorry to say that, you know, my book on free will has a subtitle, which I'll remind you of here. I do not think that, um, I should put that up on my screen here, I think. Uh, I can't do that. Um, the idea that there's a scandal going on, I find, if such a serious and important element of humanity, namely our fr freedom, our free ability, not just politically, but our, our creativity, which is a, a property, a capacity, I argue that we have, that every human being has this capacity, and even some animals can be to, extent, to an extent creative, and then deep, deep down in biology, there's a lot of things going on in evolution which could be described as new starts, differentiating, differencing themselves from what was around before that brings into existence new species. And that is a form of creativity. It hasn't been thought about. It's all a consequence of chance events, uh, variations in genes for perhaps totally accidental reasons, uh, damage reasons that are not necessarily causal, and that gives us a kind of uh, creativity even in biology. And there definitely we have creativity, in my view, in human minds. So to argue that this doesn't exist is, um, to me, a scandal. So let's go back to our picture um, our title, uh, and I'd just like to remind you, this is the current entry on my blog, my information philosophy blog, <clears throat> which you can go to um, if should you want to find any of the older uh, lectures, because as we scroll down, 
we come to what we did yesterday, and uh, so forth. Um, each time yesterday, I now this morning put a link to the um, YouTube video so you can read the description of what we were going to do, the title above, and then click on this video. And this gives us a long chronological view, uh, reverse chronological as they call it, view of all my lectures. Uh, let's just take another look at the display of lectures such as they are right now. And I am, let's see, if I take a look here, I'll show you this on your screen, full screen. You see we're up to five weeks and we're entering the sixth week. Yesterday we did the Arrow of Time. Tomorrow, this is December 26th. I'll bring that one up tomorrow. I hope this uh, gives you uh, one way of entering into all of my lectures. First way would be to do the blog and see what has been happening in the current version even before it happens. But the second way to look it up is this iFi Lectures. And I can just show you that uh, here we have uh, several um, things you can click on. Let me just go to them that, that are in our just below our header here, uh, including the link to uh, what information philosophy is all about, a little background on myself, the blog, which is here, and um, the ability, all our, my three books, and even the fourth, half of the fourth book is under this link. Uh, there's an ability to cite a page in case you're writing a paper and want a citation with the date and time retrieved from the web that's automatically generated for you so you don't have to type it out. That's for scholars who want to publish things that are that link, uh, cite my work. And then uh, what you could do to help information philosophy is under this link and of course lectures, which is this page. So these are, these are our lectures arranged in a way. You see into great problems on Mondays and then we're on Tuesday today, so free will. Tomorrow we'll talk about another uh, great example, uh, in some ways the, to me the most significant example of a person, of a philosopher who took determinism very seriously and all the way to its limits. He was a wonderful critic. Uh, his name is Ted Hunderich, and uh, we'll look at his work tomorrow after an introduction today. Then metaphysics, and I've added physics in here because to me, the deep questions of quantum physics and so forth are almost metaphysical. We get to serious, deep questions about the nature of reality, so-called nature of quantum reality. So you can look for lectures on Thursday about that topic. And finally, Albert Einstein and why I believe he was the one who discovered the most important uh, and some of the most difficult concepts in, in quantum physics. Okay, so let's go back to uh, today's blog entry. And we all know that William James introduced the terms hard determinism and soft determinism in the 1880s, and now soft determinism is known as uh, compatibilism. Let's just put this full screen. And he called it a wretched subterfuge, and we just saw that Immanuel Kant called it word juggling. Okay. Now, one of the things that uh, gives us word juggling then is uh, is this business of redefining terms. Now, words are clearly often very flexible, movable, uh, uh, especially in the hands of a creative writer who wants to say, I'm going to use this word slightly differently from the way you use, you use it. And that goes back, of course, to Alice in Wonderland and the uh, famous notion uh, that words mean exactly what I want them to mean. I can make them mean anything at any time. And uh, there have been plenty of inst instances in the history of language where a word has shifted, sometimes to mean its opposite. And after that time, it means the opposite from then on. Uh, with that in mind, we can look at what I point out here that Daniel Dennett, Daniel Dennett uh, defines free will okay, as moral responsibility. That's very strange. How can he do that? Um, it is certainly the case that throughout history, there's been a strong 
association or connection between being free and being morally responsible. Very simple idea. If you're not free and that what you do is completely determined by something, physics, your education, your genetic inheritance, whatever, if it's, if it's something else causing what you do to be done and not you, if it's not up to you, how can anyone say that you are responsible for what happened? Clearly, there's a, a deeper explanation somewhere out there, which is to be found in studying how all of our molecules and atoms contrive to do the things that we do. Uh, so I would uh, remind you then that uh, a redefinition of a term and to claim that it's suddenly that free will is something else other than what we take it to be, namely our ability to be free, um, I, that's part of the scandal in philosophy as far as I'm concerned. Okay, so there came a time in uh, the discussions um, the, in which the term incompatibilism was added, uh, and it changes the overall arrangement. Uh, just as soft determinism became compatibilism, there was a time in uh, around the 1960s, 70s time frame when, uh, when compatibilism was being criticized as perhaps not really uh, as explanatory as it could be. The, the argument went something like this. Around the 1960s, 70s time frame, people began to accept compatibilism for the reason that it broke us away from any random element uh, in, in, in freedom. And that let uh, compatibilists uh, accept the idea that we need determinism in order to be responsible for our actions. In other words, there had to be a causal connection between what I think and what I plan to do, then what I do do, and what I then must be responsible for. Without such a deterministic connection, they argued, we're in trouble. Uh, how could we be responsible if we didn't have some amount of determinism? And that's fine, I agree with that. And uh, my own model, my two-stage model of free will, says that in the second stage, when a thought becomes an action, when a um, a moment of decision makes a choice between alternative possibilities, okay? From then on, that choice to decide A rather than B or C or D, that choice to go with A is a deterministic path to the action A, for which we must accept responsibility. Uh, however, in the first stage, where we generate those alternative possibilities, A, B, C, and E, so forth, there we can allow randomness in. And that randomness uh, could extend all the way to the creation of a brand new possibility, never before considered by any thinker. Uh, this is both freedom and creativity in a very important uh, sense that I want to restore to philosophy. Uh, when philosophy professors teach these days that their students are understandable as, uh, as uh, computational processes going on in a brain that's like a computer, and the computer we all know is a sort of a state machine that goes and does things according to the programs that are in them, and there's normally not thought of much uh, freedom involved in, in computers. And then if these professors of philosophy teach that this idea that man is a machine in some sense, uh, biology might be reduced to processes coming up from below, bottom-up causation it's called, all the way to the mind, which if the body is a machine, the, the, the brain is a computer, I am very uncomfortable with all that argumentation. And I don't think it can be proved. Uh, I know computers very well. I've been a programmer and a software developer and um, used on big IBM machines from the 1960s to write my thesis. Uh, up to today, I've invented a lot of computer-related uh, products. Uh, I do not think the brain is a computer. But there is an interesting um, analogy there that it could be that we can think of the brain as a 
an algorithmic system that's evolved to do what it does. And so in some sense, there's a great, not more than a metaphor between the idea that the brain is doing calculations, computations uh, in, in a more or less uh, uh, programmed way, where the programs, it's not clear where to say they, they have come from. But the parallel between a computer uh, as hardware and the programs as software, I think is a very good, uh, and more than a, a metaphor, an analogy, uh, because software consists of pure information. As the information philosopher, I basically agree that there are, there's an aspect to information which is embodied, it has to be embodied in the computer's data uh, storage area. But what is there, the software, is really only information. It's abstract, and I, I like to point out, as you know, that it's immaterial. The software is information, information is immaterial. Nevertheless, the thinking process of, can result in actions that we take, which are motions of the, of the material body. Uh, so I'm going to argue for something that uh, Rene Descartes was hit hard uh, with arguments that there's no way that an immaterial mind can move a material body. I think uh, with information philosophy, we're going to be able to move beyond that criticism, uh, that mind cannot move body. And clearly, commonsensically, we all know that we can think and decide to wave our hand or, or do this or that and so forth. So. I, I hope I'm building a model that will meet the critical requirements of, of, of scientific and uh, philosophical theory of how things work. Uh, and uh, if so, we'll have uh, uh, some, some important uh, successes here. But out there in the world, uh, we had in, in the 19th, late 19th, 20th century this idea that we should divide things between compatible and incompatible uh, because uh, this Peter Van Eenwagen said that everything was compatible with determinism. The consequence of this idea, uh, compatibilism, would lead to the notion that everything is completely determined from time zero. And although that had been known for centuries, for some reason, when Van Eenwagen gives it the new name, compatibilism versus incompatibilism, the whole dialogue seems to shift around and dozens of young philosophers uh, start talking in terms of compatibilism versus incompatibilism. And that includes some rather prominent uh, philosophers uh, who, who then uh, develop a kind of new taxonomy. And let's take a look at this on the next page in my book here. Um, indeed, it seems to me embarrassing for libertarians, those who believe in uh, that determinism is not true, to have to describe themselves as incompatibilists. But that's basically what happened. We'll take a quick look at the diagram and come back here to what I've written. Uh, Van and Wagen basically created this taxonomy that says, let's compare and contrast compatibilism with incompatibilism and then under the heading incompatibilism, we'll put libertarianism because the libertarians do not think they are uh, compatible with determinism. And then he'll also include in this category those hard determinists. Remember the phrase came down to us from William James. These hard determinists uh, are also incompatible. They're incompatibilists. Well, there was a time in the 19, in, since 1980s or so, when Van and Wagen started this talk, students had to be able to reproduce this relationship in their tests. Did they understand the difference between compatibilists, which are believed that free will is the same thing or works with, well with determinism, and the incompatibilists, which included two different contrary uh, positions? This seems to me the absolute height of of linguistic irresponsibility. Why combine two contrary positions under one name? Um, well, maybe so you can get your students to pass tests that you've created about words that you've created. Uh, I believe this is a, a, an example of not being a clear conceptual analyst. 
these, this Van and Wagen was an analytic language philosopher, and he knows that the central issue of uh, philosophy is to be clear with our concepts and our words. Nevertheless, he creates this really, to me, very disturbing thing, which, as I say here, lumped together the libertarians and the determinists, the hard determinists, which are really the only kind. Uh, Randolph Clark wrote an article in which uh, he has these uh, convoluted and confusing title, quote, incompatibilist paren non-deterministic theories. Very strange because the incompatibilist hard determinist uh, is a determinist, uh, the, hard, the hard incompatibilist. At any rate, I, I then generated a, a much larger uh, taxonomy, which I have here in the book, and I need to back up a little bit for you to be able to see this. Um, yeah in which I believe instead of incompatibilism and, and uh, compatibilism as we had above, I'd rather go back to the historical important distinction between the deterministic theories, and there are many of them with names that I've studied on my website, and entries on all of these for you to go and look into, uh, plus of course the chapters in this book, Free Will. And on the other hand, those philosophies that uh, admit the existence of indeterminism in the world. Now, the most famous one is libertarianism. And over here, under determinism, the most famous are William James' hard determinism and then soft determinism, which today we call compatibilism. And then under hard determinism, we have hard incompatibilism, and that's a slight difference from determinism, I'll explain. Some of them call themselves, call free will an illusion. And this is, of course, a tradition in philosophy. Uh, many um, psychologists uh, argue that, that uh, the mind may be illusion, an illusion or consciousness may be illusion and so forth. And there are some who call themselves impossibilists, uh, usually connecting to the fact that moral responsibility is impossible if we are complete determinists. There can be no moral responsibility. And then along the compatibilism line, we've got a so-called semi-compatibilism, which is an interesting position that says, well, free will may not be compatible with determinism, but moral responsibility is compatible with determinism. And then under indeterminism, I bring the concept of incompatibilism just to uh, give it a big presence in, because it is big in the writings of the field of um, free will. Okay, so let's go back to our introductory note on uh, SL is good, three, here we are, let me expand this to a full screen. So we've just mentioned that Dan Dennett has defined free will as moral responsibility, but despite Dan Dennett's work, most incompatibilist and determinist except the traditional idea that determinism means the lack of moral responsibility. So besides the notion of hard incompatibilism, um, there are distinctive positions, which you saw some of them in the large taxonomy I just showed you, but just, just to start with uh, the idea of, of hard determinism here, and soft over here, which are the compatibilists, uh, you see we come down to hard incompatibilism and to illusionism. And I want to say I've identified a few of those people, uh, perhaps not in this page. So let's go back to, uh, yes, hard incompatibilism on my website, which is here. Uh, and you'll find this I'd like to just take a moment to point out that this page, I'll expand the view a little bit, and then point out that down, we're now in the section of the website called Free Will, where I define the problem, the history of the problem. Pleased to say that the history of free will now, when you put that phrase into Google, comes up with this page, the history of free will. And here are other broad areas of what we're going to uh, discuss under free will. But over on the left, you'll remember I had over here a list of philosophers, but now that's changed. 
and I'm going to expand this greatly. And I now have, instead of philosophers and scientists in the left navigation, uh, let's see if I can actually put this up on the screen behind me. Yeah, you can see it here. Um, I have a long list of important, I've done some serious work on many of these uh, concepts, core concepts I call them, under the subject area of free will. Um, actualism, uh, adequate determinism, a concept that we do have determinism for our second stage. Is the agent the cause uh, or just events the cause? Alternative possibilities, the term that William James entered. A cause that is its, itself the cause of itself. Causa sui is self-caused or uncaused by anything else except the event itself. And many, many technical terms, okay? Now, most of these technical terms I have in that glossary I just showed you, but here they are with their individual uh, pay web pages, okay? Uh, and there's lots of work here that I've done over the past 20 years or so, assembling them all into this website, which I mean for you to have available in the event that you are writing a paper uh, trying to get deeply into understanding something in your philosophy course. I hope when you hear a phrase like Harry Frankfurt's cases, you'll be able to come to this website and find an introduction, and I hope a deep enough introduction so that you come away with an understanding of what these issues have been over time. Uh, and look at this, I have no idea the count here, but something 50 or 60 different uh, web pages uh, uh, with deep explanations of things that were also in the glossary. So let me go over to the glossary for a moment. Let's take something uh, mystery, non-causality, Laplace's demon, the illusionism, and so forth. Go over here to the um, glossary, and I need to shrink the page back down again for you to get a look at it. But you see, if I was to go to the beginning of the glossary, We've just been looking down this one. I'd like you to be able to drive around in it. If we went to the letter I and clicked on I, uh, oops, I seem to have clicked on S. That's very strange. In any case, let's try to go up, get into the I's somewhere. Here's indeterminism. Here's incompatibilism, which is our subject today. And finally, here's illusion. And now illusion gives us links to other related uh, pages. Or one of the things you can do is search the Information Philosophy website. From the glossary, you can simply click search, and it will search for the word illusion. So this is another thing I'd like to teach you. And let's just do that right here and see what we get. We'll search the Information Philosophy website for illusion. And here we are searching using Google search. So first thing that comes up is an article on the illusion of determinism and then illusionism itself, then in the standard argument against free will, then incompatibilism. And then now we start to get some individuals who have their own web pages, as you know, down the left side, philosophers and scientists. Uh, and here's Saul Slomansky. We'll talk about Saul in a moment, Daniel Wegner. Here's our taxonomy, which we've been using. As I hope you'll be familiar with using that, and, uh, and a few others. Now, Let's just go, here's Saul Smolansky, and let me click and link to his page, which I already have open right here. Because uh, Saul is one of those who's made a reputation uh, for believing that uh, free will is an illusion. Oops, I guess that's too small, so we'll come back up a bit. That's probably better if I move him over so you can see the page. And then I can take that to the full screen here. And I can also switch over to my overview and show you Saul Smolansky's book, Free Will and Illusion. Um, a very prominent Israeli philosopher. I'm not sure. I've got his book marked up quite a bit. I'm not sure I can give you anything diagrammatic um, out of his book. But I'm going to look at Saul and a few others here. I, I say about him, let's find my mouse, here we are, 
that Smolensky is close. Let's see, I need to go to this view for you. Uh, Smolensky is close to a group of uh, thinkers who share a view that William James would have called hard determinism, as he said. And these are the ones I single out from at this point compared to um, those earlier uh, ones we mentioned. Anyway, there's Richard Double, Ted Honderich, and we'll talk about Ted tomorrow in Philosophers and Scientists. Derek Paraboon. Let me show you what Paraboon's book looks like. He calls it Living Without Free Will. Living Without Free Will. And he's a prominent uh, contributor to this debate. Uh, here's his objections to libertarianism. You see, I kind of mess up my books often with a lot of marginalia. And uh, that's, that's one other of those who uh, belong in a group. Uh, there's Galen Strawson, and Strawson is a very interesting person. Um, I have his book here. I'm not sure we can learn much from it, but we'll take a peek at it. It's called Freedom and Belief. And in it, he made an argument. Uh, which he calls impossibilism at some point, uh, basically proving that uh, moral responsibility is impossible. Uh, that's, of course, a very solid position of a hard determinist. The hard determinist should be saying, we have absolutely no options, there's absolutely no control, we have no control over what we do, and therefore moral responsibility is impossible. And finally, I guess I was going to mention uh, the famous uh, psychologist at Harvard and one of the three authors in the uh, psychology textbook uh, from, from Harvard, um, one of the four top uh, psychology textbooks. Uh, is, and here he is with the argument that the conscious will is simply an illusion. All right, so to get to uh, a couple of the others, let's take a look at Dirk Paraboom's page and move him over. Although, and here's an interesting example of stepping back a little bit from the commitment to a complete hard determinism. Paraboom claims to be agnostic. Okay. Uh, see it here, I hope, showing up on your screen pretty well. He argues that we should admit there is neither human freedom nor moral responsibility and that we should learn to live without free will. That's the title of his important book. And I think he would agree uh, with others uh, like uh, Saul Smolansky and Daniel Wegner, whose book we just looked at, and agree that, um, that free will is an illusion. Now, Paraboom is unusual, in, and a couple of others follow along with that, that he goes on to argue that his position of hard incompatibilism uh, would be the case not only if determinism is true, and he likes to argue with the reasoning of whether something's true or not true, he says it would be equally true, his position, if indeterminism is true. And what he's doing right here, you should recognize, is bringing in what I've been calling the standard argument against free will. Uh, because if de determinism is true, we have no freedom, there is no free will. But if indeterminism is true, so goes this standard argument against free will, we cannot possibly be responsible for our actions if those actions in, involve a chance, uh, indeterminacy, indeterminism in any way. Now, that's always seemed to me um, not thinking very clearly, because if something random occurs, and then we decide to accept that randomness as important in some way, and uh, allow it, as William James would say, 
to produce another possibility for what we do. I mean, if some random event happens in the world out there and we believe it's important enough to carry on the implications of that event, we have then mixed in a random occurrence into what it is we're about to do. But the fact that we consider it as a possibility, the fact that we then advance it to the one possibility that we choose to make the one we do based on our evaluation of the other possibilities, based on our own motives, our own feelings, our own desires, or more deeply, or our reasons. Uh, if we find that that random event somehow led us into a uh, considering an action, uh, which we think is our very best choice for the action, uh, then surely we can be responsible for that uh, action. Uh, and uh, yet most of my colleagues in academic philosophy do not embrace this particular aspect of William James thinking. I am definitely an outlier uh, and uh, they do not care for the um, idea of chance involved in, in our lives uh, as a substantial and important thing, which to me uh, opens up the door to creativity. And uh, this come back again, it comes back again to the notion that I think that much of academic philosophy is being scandalous uh, in saying that we young people they're teaching don't have any, uh, any freedom, any creativity even is the implication, and that somehow uh, they are more to be thought of as machines with brains that are computers and that somehow neuroscience is going to look in, discover the operation of the computer aspect of our brain, and explain that all of us are just uh, not making things happen, but are things happening for reasons, for causes outside of ourselves. I think this is a, a very unfortunate position to be in. So there's Derek Paraboom, and I have one other interesting person to talk about. Uh, and we'll perhaps do a lot more uh, on, on him later uh, because uh, Galen Strawson has a very famous uh, father, Sir Peter P.F. Strawson, who wrote a very important essay uh, back in the um, 1960s time frame, I think. And um, so here's the page on Strawson, and I've jumped off for a moment. Let me bring this up to full screen. Um, oops, wrong one. How about this one? No, how about this one? There we go. So Strawson's father, Sir Peter Strawson, had written an essay called Freedom and Resentment. And in this essay, he said what he called our attitudes and our feelings about praise, blame, and punishment, that these attitudes, he said, are human reactions which would not disappear if determinism were true. Uh, and indeed, like many of these others we've just seen, like Paraboom saying, well, maybe my argument could hold even if there was indeterminism in the universe. Uh, I think he's wrong, but uh, so Peter Strawson said, I'm agnostic about whether it's determinism or indeterminism, but whichever way it goes, we would still feel bad occasion sometimes when something happened out there that, that bothered us, that we felt someone else had done something wrong, or even we ourselves had done something wrong. And we would feel the need for, to give someone, to blame someone for the wrong thing that's happening. If we need to, uh, if we feel they deserve blame, perhaps they even deserve punishment. And Str Strawson uh, described this as having a feeling of resentment. Uh, we think people shouldn't be behave the way we just saw, and we react to that bad behavior. or. To be fair, we could also uh, feel that uh, we see some very good behavior that deserves our praise. So Strawson is saying the ideas, the human feelings, then they're really emotionally based, not necessarily reason-based, but they could be reason-based if it goes along with the 
uh, tradition in the society for what constitutes uh, good behavior, bad behavior, and so forth. We could reasonably say person X deserves blame for something they've just done, and perhaps even go on to say they deserve punishment. This, Strawson decided, was a separate question, and he did, in fact, uh, change the discussion. He separated the whole discussion of uh, an idea of freedom that a libertarian might want that somehow depended on the existence of, uh, of free options in the world. He said, I can't understand that, he even said literally, I do not understand the problem of free will and determinism, which is very strange because he's a very intelligent person. But he goes on to say, I'm going to get beyond that, I'm going to put that problem behind me, and what we're going to do now is talk about uh, uh, resentment. Put aside freedom and notice we always would have resentment and we would feel uh, we would resent bad behavior and we would approve of good behavior. Uh, now that's the background of, of, of Galen Strawson, but I also want to note that uh, Sir Peter also said that uh, we, would, we would, could be divided uh, at this time of thinking about moral responsibility and say some of them are optimists. Uh, and that I think he was talking about a compatibilist because an optimist would say, well, you know, we're compatible with determinism, but I still think there's moral responsibility. And there also could be pessimists, he said. Now, his son, Galen Strawson, who comes to Cambridge reasonably often, I uh, listened to him for a day at the Harvard Philosophy Department a couple of years ago talking about his recent work. Um, he developed what he calls a basic argument, and uh, I'll just give you a, a, a feeling of it. Uh, since I've got this standard argument against free will, he uses an argument which he calls the basic argument against free will, and that is it, it just goes down the idea of the perfect causal chain. Um, it basically says, uh, let's see if I have, I'm not sure I have his basic argument on this page. Here's the introduction to freedom and belief and in terms of moral responsibility. And I'm not sure I'm going to get there, but I'll show you one of the tools I use. Let's do control F. Little window opens up up here. Let me bring this to full screen so you see what I'm doing. I could type in basic argument. And be, again, what I'm trying to do is teach you have I got that reason? Very tiny type, so you can probably hardly see it. And I've clicked, click, and here we are. Come back to this level of screen with you. And again, I'm trying to teach you that the website has huge amounts of stuff in it that I can't always have completely at the fingertips on one of my screens here. And I'm always tempted to show you a view. Let's take a view of my screens. <laughs> At this point, I've, I've got this middle screen on my website and the basic argument. On this left screen, you may or may not be able to see a little blue taxonomy. Uh, same thing on this right-hand screen at the moment, which I can expand perhaps to the point where you can see that. Or maybe if I'm on one, I could zoom in a little bit. So you can see there's my right-hand screen, the middle screen, which I will now come back to. What Strawson did was write an article called The Impossibility of Moral Responsibility. Uh, so that's about 23 years ago, and it's become his standard uh, discussion out there. He always is famous for saying uh, there can be no moral responsibility. And that impossibility that he called it has, is also known in the taxonomy as impossibilism. And there are several people who describe themselves as impossibilist. I always <laughs> admire the chutzpah, sort of, of someone who says, I can prove to you that it's impossible that you are morally responsible for anything. And the same person will go around and blame you for knocking the cup of coffee off the table and making a mess, and you've got to better go clean it up or whatever. I mean, the amazing inconsistency between these philosophers, the level of thinking about deep philosophical questions and everyday notions of freedom, which they have just like everyone else. But what um, 
What Strawson has to say here is there's an argument, which I call the basic argument, which appears to prove that we cannot be truly or ultimately morally responsible for our actions. According to the basic argument, it makes no difference whether determinism is true or false. We can't be truly or ultimately morally responsible for our actions in either case. And basically, although he goes through lots and lots of steps, the whole argument boils down I'm sure I'd like you to go back and read this um, if you want to be more familiar with a particular kind of hard incompatibilist with which there can be no moral responsibility. Galen Strawson is an excellent person to study. But it comes down to saying, look, any particular event that happens, either it was caused by a prior event in the causal chain, causal closure, and so forth, all the way back. Well, we're not responsible for that. Or it happened at random. And we're not responsible for that. End of story. Every single thing that ever happens must follow from either a determined cause or an undetermined cause. Neither one has responsibility. But you must recognize that is what I call the standard argument against free will. And it fails in two ways. It fails because if in the first stage there is some randomness, that may lead to creativity. It may lead to what William James calls a an, an alternative possibility, an, a new alternative possibility. The fact that it popped into our head as he describes it, the fact that it seems to come from nowhere. We have no reason for, for thinking it at the moment. And I'm sure all of you have had this experience that suddenly you come up with a new idea and you may not be at all clear as to where that idea came from, okay? If that is random, and then you proceed to compare this new random action or thought with others, and come to the conclusion that, why don't we go with that idea and see what happens, and just try it out. And in the second stage, we are determined adequately, is my phrase, to follow that thought to the action, and that in the second stage of will, the willed stage we can call it, there is a flow of uh, causality that leads from the thought to the action. And we can say we're radically determined. But we're not predetermined, which is the big objection to determinism. We are not predetermined by whatever happened in the universe up until this moment, especially if, as I've just argued, we can claim that something came into our minds which presented us with something that was not caused by anything prior. So where Galen Strawson essentially attacks uh, our notion of freedom uh, by saying if it's random, we're not responsible, it's quite the contrary. If it's randomly popped into our heads, up to us, it entered the universe through our mind, uh, why can't we be responsible if when we think about that idea, a creative idea, and decide to go with it, we have actually contributed new information to the universe, which is my way of thinking about almost every uh, piece of work I'm doing in philosophy and physics, because I am the information philosopher. So today we've discussed this notion that the um, hard determinists and incompatibilists can claim that there's no moral responsibility. And yet I'm going to want to say that uh, we have that, we have that uh, responsibility uh, if we want to just accept it in terms of random new ideas don't make us random. A random event does not make us random if we then apply reason and our own motives, our own feelings, our character to whether or not we go with that new option or not. That's just what it means to be free and to be creative. So thank you uh, for being here today. Hope to pursue this subject a bit more tomorrow by looking at the work of Ted Honderich, who is one of the really great um, determinists. But he recognizes that it has a big problem. He calls it a black thing because determinism appears to totally eliminate this sense of responsibility. Uh, so he's in the category with these others, but Ted Honderich thinks this is not a good idea, and he's written extensively 